Hi there, welcome to Paint and Zoo. My name's Matt and you've joined us today up here at our Croc Swamps exhibit. Now I know that some of you are still at school and some of you are learning from home, but we thought you might like to come to the zoo today to learn a little bit about adaptations. Now the first thing to do is to explain a little bit about what adaptations are. But I want you to imagine, instead of being here at the zoo, I want you to imagine that you're feeling hungry. What would you do? Okay, the first thing that you would do is just walk into the kitchen, open a cupboard and find some food. But for animals and for plants that are trying to survive out in the wild, it's not quite so easy. Okay, so for an animal or a plant out in the wild, if they're trying to survive, then maybe their habitat, the place where they live, uh, can be quite a difficult place to live, quite a challenging place to live. So uh, adaptations are features, things about an animal or a plant, living things, that help them to live in the places where they're found. They help them to survive and to thrive as well. So if you look at an animal or at a plant, but especially if you're looking at an animal, sometimes you can see things about it that help it to live in those places. Now, if you think about living somewhere really hot, really dry, then what would be the problem there? Okay, if you're living somewhere really hot, really dry, then you're going to spend a lot of your time uh, like gasping for water, even if you're a plant. So if we think about the adaptations that plants show, then that might be a good place to start. Now, if you look at a cactus, it doesn't look like a normal plant that we think of. When we think of plants, like things like trees, then we think of, an, uh, of, a, of a, a plant growing up with leaves at the top to catch the sunlight. But cacti, because they have got to try and hold on to their moisture, they grow a little bit differently. So instead of having leaves, their leaves have actually changed into the spines that we see. And they help to protect the, the cactus to stop it from being eaten by, uh, by animals. But they also help to, to keep the water in the plant as well, to stop the air from flowing over it as much. And the shape of a cactus can often give us a bit of a clue about what it's doing as well. They hold water inside their stem. And if you look at a cactus, they're quite often a round shape or a very chunky shape. They're called succulents and that helps to keep the water inside. Now those, the shape and the spines, are both adaptations that help the cactus to live where it does in a dry place. Now, let's have a think about an animal. What if you were thinking about an animal like a giraffe? Okay, if you're an animal like a giraffe and you're thinking about your food. Now if you think about going to go and get that food from the cupboard that I asked you to think about at the start, if you went to the cupboard and the food was high up, not everybody in your house would be able to reach that high shelf. And with a giraffe, it's just the same. The giraffes, because they've got that long neck and those long legs, they can reach the high food that other animals can't reach. So just like uh, somebody smaller can't reach the tall shelves in the cupboard, then a giraffe can reach the tallest shelves in the cupboard. It can get to the food that other animals can't reach, and that helps it to live where it does. If you think that a giraffe might be living in a savanna, and at certain times of the year, the grass could be grazed away by all the zebra and the wildebeest. Well, a giraffe can still find food by grazing and nibbling on the uh, leaves at the top of the trees. And that long neck is an adaptation. It's something about the animal that helps it to live where it does. Now, there's another neat adaptation with giraffes as well. If you look closely, if you come here to paint and you see our lovely giraffes, if they're eating, they stick their long tongues out. And they've got amazing long tongues which they wrap around the branches. And then when they pull their tongue back in, they can pull all the bark and the leaves and the shoots off of the trees. And that's what they love to eat. Okay? Now, my tongue's not that long. Okay? But that's a special feature about giraffes. It's something about the way that they uh, are built or the way their bodies work or the way they behave that helps them to live where they do. So that is an adaptation.
Right, now we've explained what an adaptation is, we're going to see if you can spot the adaptations that some of our plants and animals show here at Paynton Zoo. So, we're going to show you a little clip of uh, one of our animals, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, and I want you to see if you can guess the adaptation that that animal or plant shows. So, if you're working at school, then maybe you can turn to somebody next to you, and you can try and work out what the adaptation is, so you just can have a short time to guess the adaptations. If you're working at home, maybe you can write the answer down on a piece of paper. Okay, and then we're going to see if you can get the answer right. So the first one we're going to look at is the meerkat. Now we've got lovely meerkats here at the zoo. We've got a whole mob that live together and they would normally be found in places like uh, South Africa and Namibia. They live in a really dry, bright place, okay, the desert. And it's so bright that they spend a lot of time looking out okay, for predators. They really need to keep their eyes open for predators, but also for food as well. And uh, remember, it's a really bright, sunny place. So can you spot something about our meerkats that would help them live in the place where they're found in the wild? You've got 15 seconds. Are you ready? Three, two, one, off you go. Right now, I wish I could hear your answers to see what you've come up with. But if you look at meerkats, they've got a really interesting adaptation which helps them to live in the bright sunny places where they're found. And that is if you look underneath their eyes, they've got dark patches. And those dark patches, uh, scientists think, help to reduce the glare from the sunshine. If you imagine looking out at a bright sunny desert all day long, okay, you'd end up squinting, wouldn't you? You'd be having trouble uh, seeing. And if they miss something like a martial eagle as it swoops in, okay, then they could be in real trouble. So meerkats have got dark patches underneath their eyes that help to reduce the glare from the sun so they can keep a lookout when they're looking around for predators or for prey as well. So that's their adaptation. Now, for our next adaptation, we're going to talk a little bit about one of our big scary animals here at the zoo, which are our wonderful Sumatran tigers. Okay, now Sumatran tigers are normally found in the dark forests in Sumatra, in, over in Indonesia, and they do often be hunting either at, at dusk or heading into night time. Now if you're a big cat and you're hunting for prey at night, then it can be a little bit awkward to find your way around the forest. Okay, so our Sumatran tigers have got some adaptations that help them to find their way around, but importantly, they've got an adaptation that helps them to bite in just the right place when they're so close to their prey that they can't see what they're doing. Can you spot? on our Sumatran tiger, what helps them to bite in the right place. Are you ready? You've got 15 seconds. Talk to the kid next to you, okay? Or write your answers down on a piece of paper. Three, two, one, off you go. Now, I can give you a bit of a clue. If you look at our Sumatran tigers, they've got amazingly long whiskers. Now, scientists have been studying their whiskers and have basically worked out that a big cat's whiskers help it not only to find its way around when it's brushing near things, but also to bite in the right place. So I think that's a bit of a scary adaptation. Okay, those lovely long whiskers are actually helping them to, uh, to grab their prey in just the right place to kill it quickly. Okay, an interesting adaptation. Now, you may well have guessed as well that our uh, Sumatran tigers have got another adaptation which is their stripes. If you look at tigers, their stripes are an adaptation. It's something about the way that their body uh, is, is made that helps them to hide in the forest. So when they're going through the dappled shade in places like the rainforest, those stripes help them to disappear. Okay, so camouflage is an adaptation. Now, I want you to imagine that you're an ape. You're a, an ape, it's as heavy as me, okay, but you really like fruit. Now, I do like fruit, okay, but the fruit I like comes from my fruit bowl, okay, or from the supermarket. It's not found at the top of the tree. So what if you're an ape living out in the wild and you love eating lovely ripe fruit and that fruit is always growing at the top of the tree, okay? If you're a big ape, what sort of adaptations might you have that would help you to get to that fruit, okay? So that would help you uh, to find your way around the forest. If you look at our orangutans, Okay, maybe you can guess the adaptation that they show. Ready? Three, two, one, off you go. Now, if you hold up your hands and look at them, 
then you, I'm sure you can see that you've got opposable thumbs. So you can grip things with your hands, okay, because of the way you can move your thumbs. Now, orangutans, if you watch them climb, can do the same thing with their feet. Now, I wish I could do that. They can actually pick things up, they can hold on to branches with their feet and with their hands. If you're a big ape, something like an orangutan, and orangutans are the ape that spends the most time up in the forest, the big ape that spends the most time up in the canopy of the forest, then having feet and hands that you can grasp with is a real advantage because it means that you can keep safe when you're climbing up vines and rainforest trees. Now, some rainforest trees could be a hundred meters in height. So that's a place where you really wouldn't want to lose your grip and fall. So an orangutan can actually hold on with both hands and both feet at the same time. So having grippy toes, uh, grippy big toes, uh, really helps them. Another adaptation. Right, now we've looked at adaptations, we've explained what they are, I've asked you to look for adaptations on our animals and plants and see if you can guess what they are, but now I want you to try one harder thing, which is to see if you can predict an adaptation. So, have you been paying attention? We're going to see if you can guess the adaptation shown by an animal, okay, that helps it live in the wild. So, I want you to imagine that you are a large reptile, a large reptile that likes sneaking up on other animals to eat them, and you need to get close to them to be able to grab them. Now maybe you found that a good way to hunt is through the water, so you can get close to those other animals through the water. What, how might you, your body, over millions of years, how might your body change to help you to get closer to the animals, to help you to hide? So have a little think. I want you to turn to the kid next to you, or if you're on your own, have a little think and write some answers down. You've got 20 seconds to come up with some ideas about how an animal might adapt to make it better at hunting okay, in water to get close to other animals. Three, two, one, go. Right, now a crocodile is built to get close to other animals stealthily. They're well camouflaged but the very shape of their head actually helps them as well. If you look at some of our crocs here, you can see that with a crocodile, the eyes and the nostrils are on the top of the skull. They're very different from us, okay? And the way that they're built actually helps them. So when they're in the wild and they're trying to sneak up on prey, they can sneak up with just their nose and their eyes showing. Okay, so there's very little left of an enormous crocodile to give a clue that it's there and they can get very close to them. And that helps them to hunt, it's an adaptation. The camouflage helps them too, and that helps them to live in the wild. Okay, now you might be wondering how these adaptations come about. It's not like there was suddenly a cactus that was covered in spines, okay, or there was suddenly a giraffe with the longest neck, okay. Scientists think that these changes that help the animal or the plant live where it does, they think these adaptations came about over millions of years. If you look, go back to the giraffe that we started the lesson with and you look at it, okay, maybe a long time ago there was an ancestor of a giraffe that had a lot shorter neck that looked like a lot of the other forest animals that we find uh, even today. But maybe then one day one of the offspring had a slightly longer neck that meant it could reach some of the leaves that, it's, uh, that the other animals couldn't reach and that allowed it to grow bigger and stronger and gave it an advantage. Okay, maybe then it was able to have offspring and pass that slightly longer neck on. And over time, over millions of years, okay, that giraffe grew with a longer and longer neck. Now, if we look at the giraffe's closest relative today, which is the akapi, then it looks a lot like a giraffe, really stripy, and with a much shorter neck. And that just gives us an idea of maybe that's the way that it worked, that the giraffe got a slightly longer neck that gave it an advantage and allowed it to live uh, in places like the savannah, where some of the animals are struggling to find enough food, but a giraffe can reach the food, the leaves, that the others can't. Now, we call that process evolution. So over time, the animal changes, very small changes, and that helps it to live where it does. Okay? It gets a competitive advantage, and that helps it, an adaptation. Now, we've got one final fun task for you to do when this lesson is finished, because we're nearly finished. Okay, and that is that I would like you to design an adaptation for yourself. 
Now I want you to have a little think about the adaptation that you would choose. So I would choose, as my adaptation, that I would like a long prehensile tail like a spider monkey. Now prehensile means that it can grip things with its tail. And if you look at a spider monkey, they've got a long tail that they can wrap around branches and they can hold tight with it. And in fact, spider monkeys have got an extra adaptation because they've got a little area at the end of their tail with no fur, they've got little grooves on it and it helps them to grip. And I would like a tail like a spider monkey, long and prehensile with a non-slip pad at the end so that I can use it to hold on to my mug of coffee and I can do other work while I'm holding on to my coffee. Now, I would like you to come up with an adaptation like mine. Maybe you choose to have wings so you could fly around. But I want you to choose an adaptation and then I want you to show other people what your adaptation would look like either by uh, drawing a picture of you with that adaptation or by making a model using modeling clay maybe you can make a little model of you with a tail or wings or you could uh, take a photo on your phone and edit it to show what you would look like with that adaptation so I want you to have some fun come up with an adaptation and then tell us how it would help you to live in your habitat so I'm gonna say uh, for example that in the style of an advert, I'm going to say new. Matt's spider monkey tail helps him to hold on to his coffee and multitask. Okay, so we want you to have some fun, come up with an adaptation, and then make a model, draw a picture, show people what your adaptation would be like. Now, thank you very much for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at adaptations, and I hope to see you soon. Cheers.